I'm going in for a sex change. The last thing that I want to see is my doctor biting off some weenies. Hello, all you guys, girls, and my non-binary friends out there. Welcome back to my channel. <laughs> I'm so happy to see you all. Today is the first episode in a brand new series on my channel called Makeup and Queer Story. The series was inspired by YouTuber Bailey Saran's series, Murder Mystery in Makeup Mondays. About a year ago, I found myself being super interested in queer history, whether it's people in history, events, whatever. I was taking notes and I was just super intrigued and it was just weighing so heavily on my head that I figured, why not come on here and tell all of you lovely people what's what on LGBT history? One more notice, it is extremely hot in my state, so I do have the AC on and I'm hoping it doesn't seem too loud for you guys. I have my fan on, it's just so much. It's literally nine in the morning and I'm dripping with sweat in an air conditioned bedroom. So, you know. If you're ever interested in the products that I'm using, I'll link them all in the description box down below. I want the series to be more about the history and less about the makeup. So I don't want to stop with every single piece and tell you what I'm using, what I'm doing. So if you're interested, either leave a comment or check the description box down below. And without further ado, let's get into today's video. So for those of you who might not know, my name is Victoria and I am a transgender woman. I make trans content here on YouTube. If you're new here, please make sure that you click that subscribe button down below so you're notified whenever I post a new video. But today, we are talking about a little piece of trans history. As you guys know, there have been so many advancements that have been made in the trans medical field that it's crazy to look at where we were like 30, 50 years ago to where we are now. So doctors back then would either not operate on trans patients at all, would have an incredibly long wait list, or they didn't know what they were doing and they would just lop parts off. Back in the day, doctors had little to no concern for transgender wellness. So they'd either just lop off the penis entirely when they were doing a sex change or they would invert it with no construction of a labia, no sensation for the clitoris, nothing. And because of these advancements, it is so less often that you see trans girls going to back alley places for surgeries on card tables and garages, but it still happens all the time. Dr. John Ronald Brown, also known as Dr. Butcher Brown, was one of these back alley surgeons. So Dr. John Brown was born into a Mormon family on July 14th, 1922. His father was also a physician and according to him he was quite domineering and he later pointed to that as the reasoning for why he did poorly on the oral exam on a surgery board certification. I'm sure that's the only reason why you did poorly on your exam. But anyway, Dr. Brown was great throughout all of school. His teachers loved him. He had friends. He did so well in school, in fact, that when he was drafted for World War II, the army sent him to the Utah School of Medicine where he graduated in 1947. Dr. Brown then went on to be a general practitioner for about 20 years where he was doing pretty well until he almost lost a patient during a routine thyroidectomy. Now, Dr. Brown referred to this as a little hiccup, a little hiccup because he almost killed somebody. He almost just, you know, a little hiccup, like oopsie, almost killed someone, just crazy, another day in the life. So because of this, he decided to pursue a formal training in surgery. Um, would have been a great idea to get that training before you started doing surgeries, um, but do you, girl? So Dr. Brown did very well in all of his schooling when he got his surgical training. However, as I said before, he failed his medical um, oral exam and he pointed to his father as the reasoning for that because he was saying that his father was so domineering and he was so aggressive that he just couldn't even function socially. And he was having trouble speaking, having trouble remembering things when he was talking. And so even though he failed the oral exam, Dr. Brown did not let this stop him. Oh no, oh no, he decided to open up his own practice in San Francisco. Dr. Brown loved the technical side of surgery and the weird body modifications. He operated almost exclusively on transgender women and he claimed that he did up to 600 sex change operations. And this cannot be confirmed or denied because it was not done in a real facility. So we don't know exactly how many, but he says it was up to 600. You might be asking yourself if he was Dr. Butcher Brown, if he didn't have the certification, why did girls still go to him? And that's a great question. While a lot of girls did have very bad results and got botched, some even died, he did have some patients that had great successes. Like one woman named Mimi, 
Mimi was his poster patient. She was in a cis straight relationship for so long and her partner I guess didn't even know that she wasn't born a female and all of this great stuff. So girls would hear this and hear that there was no weight line. They would hear that he was doing this new method and they would go straight to him. Back in the 70s and the 80s and into the 90s, there was little to no consideration for transgender health. So when it came to getting a sex change, they really only cared about creating just a hole for men to be able to stick it into. And nowadays, of course, there's a whole construction of a labia, there's the clitoris and sensation. So the girls were hearing that he actually had this new method that they were interested in. This method was called the ilium loop or ilium loop. I'm not really sure how to pronounce it. I'll put it right here. But it consisted of taking a chunk from the, a chunk, oh gross, a strip from the intestines and moving into the vaginal canal to make a natural feeling and looking vagina. This method is now coined by Dr. Saporn in Thailand as the Saporn method. So I'm really interested to see if there's any like crossover or, you know, surgical training crossovers that happen there because it's the same procedure, but it's called the Saporn method. Hmm. On top of all of that, Brown charged a mere $2,500 for what other doctors were charging up to $20,000 for. So the girls that were turning tricks could literally just go out, turn a couple tricks, um, come back and have a vagina. Crazy. Best of all, or perhaps worst of all, Dr. Brown did not have any wait list. There were no requirements. So you could go in as long as you had money, you could just get operated on. So there was no wait list. Back in the day, patients, transgender patients specifically, had to wait one to six years living full-time as a female or as a male, whatever you're transitioning to and being on hormones for that long before they were even considered to be transgender and being able to be operated on. So, and while this keeps patients safe a lot of the times, it also is difficult because not everyone can afford to be on hormones all this time. Not everyone can afford to be living full-time without having these procedures done. Trans women were vulnerable, they were poor, and they were desperate, and therefore the perfect patients for Dr. Brown. His clients at the time were all poor transsexual women, as well as patients of Stanford University and John Hopkins Hospital's transsexualism treatment program from the 60s. Here's where the story gets weird. I mean, I know it's been weird, but it's especially weird at this point. So I mentioned before that Dr. Brown operated not only on transgender patients, but he also specialized in patients with something called BIID or body integrity identity disorder. And this is people that have perfectly healthy limbs that want them amputated for no real reason, usually for sexual pleasure. And that is why I found this story so interesting, you guys, because he saw trans women as the same thing as these people that wanted their legs cut off just to get a heart on. And he was hiding behind using our our experience, our narrative as a, a guard, as saying whenever he went to court, he and his attorney would like pound on the desk saying he is the only man that will operate on transgender women, on operating on society's outcasts. He's just a savior. He's helping these trans women one by one. And if you're putting him away, he's just never gonna be able to operate on them again. Who's gonna help them? Um, meanwhile, he's literally seeing them as the same as someone that wants their leg amputated and he's not caring when he kills them or causes their suicide by butchering them. But yeah, Dr. Brown did not follow any of the necessary guidelines for admitting people to surgery. As long as you had cash, he would just let you right on in. And although he had some okay results and he had some trans women testify on his behalf when in court, he has an overwhelming number of ex-patients old friends and old colleagues that had nothing but bad things to say about him as a surgeon. He has been compared to being as close to Joseph Mengel as you can get. If you don't know who Joseph Mengel or Mengel or however you pronounce it is, if you're not of the weak of heart, I recommend that you look him up. He was a Nazi doctor that would perform experiments on his patients. He was just an absolutely horrendous human being. So he was often compared to him. Uh, his ex coworker, Dr. Fisher, actually said he was always shaking. He was so bizarre that he, quote, doesn't know how to make a straight incision. Patients often say that he was very shaky and jittery and very disheveled. He would have messy hair a lot. Sometimes he'd be wearing one shoe and they are count seeing him walk around his office 
eating raw hot dog weenies from the bag. I don't know about you guys, but if I'm going in for a sex change, the last thing that I wanna see is my doctor biting off some weenies. So finally, in 1977, Dr. Brown finally had his medical license revoked after the botching of one surgery and the death of another. The California Board of Medical Quality Assurance revoked his license on the basis of, quote, gross negligence and competent in a manner in which involved moral turpitude. Investigator Jerry McClellan from the California Medical Licensing Board described Brown as having, quote, no social conscience and a sincere sociopath. But once again, once again, he certainly did not let this stop him. God forbid. He did not let this stop him and he decided to continue operating. He operated outside of California, resulting in him being barred from Hawaii, from Alaska, and from the island of St. Lucia. Now, the island of St. Lucia brings me to where he met his wife, Julie. Julie was a beautiful, Caribbean native from the island of St. Lucia. He met her, he fell in love with her. Only issue was this girl was 14 and Dr. Brown was 59. She was 14, he was 59. I'm gonna say that one more time. She was 14 and he was 59. So there's a lot wrong with that that we could unpack, but I'm actually just gonna leave it at that because there's so much more to the story that you are not even ready for. He and Julie went on to have two sons and when asked if she was sold to him when he visited the island of St. Lucia later down the line after he got arrested again, she said that she was not a cow and she was very offended that they would even suggest that. I just dropped my makeup palette and that's why y'all just like so Dr. Brown was continuing to solicit surgery in the United States and in Mexico. And in 1986, Dr. Brown developed a procedure that would lengthen the penis for one or two inches. This of course caught the attention of Playboy magazines, the Penthouse Forum. And in May of 1986, they published an article called The Incredible Dick Doctor. Now, Playboy decided to send their reporters right on out to this incredible incredible dick doctor's place, this incredible man that can just make penises grow and is so professional and so innovative and intelligent. So they sent somebody out to see him perform this surgery. Now in the article, they described his setup as being anything but professional. According to reporters when they went there, it was just a dirty, nasty facility. He was totally disheveled. He was wearing one shoe. And when he was operating on his patient, his pants actually fell down. Now I get it, sometimes you don't have a belt, sometimes your pants fall down. Not during surgery, honey, not during surgery. I can tell you one thing, if I woke up during surgery and my doctor's pants were down, that'd be the day. Also at one point during the surgery, he actually made a wrong incision and he severed a vein or an artery or something in this man's penis. And it started to bleed just absolutely everywhere. And he said he quote, made an oops. Oopsie. Oh my God, whoops. I just totally cut your penis off. I'm so sorry. Wow, I'm so silly. Like I mentioned before, body modification was kind of Dr. Brown's thing. So he continued to solicit surgery, whether it was online in body modification groups or in gay clubs or transgender communities. There's actually a video that I'll link in the description down below of his close associate named Mr. J who was soliciting these different services on a YouTube video. He's advertising castration, silicone injections, shaft extensions and reductions reductions why would you whatever so dr brown continued to operate and continued to get more and more patients until about 1990 when he i believe messed up somebody's hairline and she filed for a lawsuit against him the story of this 30 year old trans woman's botched hairline was so upsetting to the jury that they decided to sentence him to a mere 19 months in prison. 19, less than two years, months in prison for operating without a license and boshing trans women. I don't know about you guys, um, but to me, that sounds um, like it's not quite enough. Not gonna lie. Um, and it surely proved to not matter because sure enough, Dr. Brown was released. He worked as a taxi cab driver for about a year and then he got reestablished in the medical community after a year of working as a taxi cab driver. 
This man was sent to prison. He lost his medical license. He botched these people. He couldn't even, he was doing stuff under the table in garages and he got reestablished in the medical community. Cool. So Dr. Brown continued to perform sex change operations and other weird body modification procedures. Not that a sex change is a weird body modification procedure, but by his standards, he saw it that way. So he continued to do that for quite some time. And like I mentioned, he also specialized in patients that had BIID or body integrity identity disorder. And this is where that comes into play. On May 9th, 1998, Dr. Brown had a leg amputation patient of the age of 79 by the name of Philip Bondi. He decided to perform this procedure down in his office in Tijuana and then send him on his merry little happy, horny, stumpy way back to his hotel in California to recover. So he performed this leg amputation on Mr. Bondi for a total of $10,000. I don't really know what that conversation would have been like. I can't really imagine reaching out to somebody and being like, hey man, can you cut off my leg for 10 grand? And he's like, yeah, you got the cash. I'm like, yeah, I'll be there in 20 minutes. He's like, sweet. Uh, can't wait to see your little stumpy ass. He sends him on his merry little way back to his hotel in California, where unfortunately, Mr. Bondi quickly developed gangrene because he noticed the skin was actually sewn too closely to the stump that uh, he now had. And because of this, there wasn't enough blood flow to the skin and his leg actually turned black and this man died. Now keep in mind, this isn't the first person that this man has killed. This is the first white man that this man has killed. Now the cops have had a case on Dr. Brown for quite some time. As you know, he's spent some time in prison and they're just on the lookout to watch him screw up once again so that they can get him sent away forever. So the police come knocking on Dr. Brown's door in San Ysidro and they said, do you know what this is about? And he said immediately, it's about the man that died in the hotel room in California. So he knew exactly what had happened, did not care, just waiting for the cops to come and show up, I guess. So they took him into custody, and once again, the police described him as being incredibly disheveled. When he left the house, he grabbed a stained jacket and a wrinkly shirt, apparently, and he just left, which is crazy. And when the cops went through his home, they found like blood-soaked couches, a blood-soaked mattress with the blood-soaked sheets, and surgical instruments, anesthesia, anesthesia medicine, and about 100 or 200 tubes of super glue, which is what you use when you are pumping somebody or whatever, and you are, you just close the little holes for the silicone so they don't leak out. So when he was at the police station, Dr. Brown was being interrogated, and I guess he'd been there for a little too long for his desire. He was left unattended, and he got bored. He got bored, you guys. Are you kidding? He's like, oh God, I just want to leave. Like, I'm so bored here. Is someone ever going to come talk to me? God. So he decided, you know what? I'm going to leave. No, you know what? I am going to leave. You know what? No, I am going to leave. He decided he was going to up and leave. So he got up. He just walked out that front door, walked on out. He got two blocks before he was surrounded by armed cop cars and brought back into custody. This was the end of the rope for Dr. Brown and the cops were certain to not let him back to destroy the transgender community. In order to do this, Deputy DA Stacy Rodriguez of California compiled a bunch of transgender former patients to testify against Dr. Brown. I'm going to be telling you three of these women's stories. There's a lot more if you're interested. I have all of my resources in the description down below. So if you want to read these firsthand or read the court cases, I highly recommend it. It's really interesting. So first off is Christina. Christina was incredibly excited to be getting her surgeries. She actually mortgaged her home in order to pay for a total of 10 feminizing surgeries. Most important among these surgeries, of course, was her sex change. Christina had waited her entire life to finally be able to have the vagina that she was always meant to have. Unfortunately for Christina, the skin grafts that he used for the vaginal canal were too thin and they actually ripped during sex. The nose job that he performed on her had two separate sized nostrils and an upturned nose like a pig. He had also removed two of her lower ribs, which resulted in her having an abscess on her rib cage the size of a basketball. And when he made her vagina, it made her too tight. So when she tried to get it a little bit loosened and a little more comfortable, he felt that he quote, ruined her. So unfortunately, Dr. Brown had called Christina's residence trying to refund $500 to her for some kind of botched procedure or whatever. 
and he ended up getting Christina's mother on the phone. And Christina's mother, unfortunately, let him know that Christina had actually hanged herself in the garage earlier that week. Now, according to officials, Dr. Brown took this very well, and he actually just attributed it to saying that, quote, transsexuals have a high suicide rate. Not because you butchered her, not because you ruined her life, just because we're all crazy, right? Next on the list is Mona. Mona was in it for a smaller reason. She just wanted a facelift and some breast implants. She was trying to look a little more femme. She was trying to have a younger face. And unfortunately for her, that is not what she left with. When he was performing her facelift, Dr. Brown actually sliced a nerve in her face and she was left with a permanently droopy and crooked smile. And when he performed her breast augmentation, they actually failed and rejected, which is very uncommon, but it does happen. Her breast turned black and began to leak a fluid that her boyfriend said smelled like cat urine. Most effective in the testifying against Dr. Brown was a woman named Camille. Before surgery, Camille was a successful insurance underwriter. She was relatively confident and she was excited to be going in for surgery. After surgery with Dr. Brown, Camille says that she was lucky to find a gig that paid $5 an hour. So it starts off with Camille saying that she actually woke up 10 minutes before surgery was over, which isn't totally uncommon with longer procedures. And he said, don't worry, honey, you're fine. Everything's gonna be great. When recovering, Dr. Brown gave her a couch cushion in the shape of a phallus and told her to cover it in a condom and to use it for dilation to keep her vaginal canal open and to keep it in with bra straps. Now, I don't know how many of you know exactly what dilators are, but we get them now after getting a sex change, which I have had. Go click my last video if you want to know about that. They give you these long, hard plastic dildos that keep your vaginal canal open. And he gave her a couch cushion and bra straps. After a few days, Camille went back to her home in San Fernando Valley where she was recovering. And unfortunately, that is where she developed a fistula. For those of you who don't know, this is kind of graphic, but it's when there is an erosion between the colon and vaginal wall so feces actually pours out through the vaginal canal and it sounds gross because it is it is a complication that can happen but it's incredibly uncommon and it's excruciatingly painful and very dangerous her bladder was blocked her lymph glands were swelling up her skin was turning yellow she said there was some black stuff coming out of her lungs she couldn't stop hiccuping she was unable to stand and she was near death's door it took about five days. Her friends were wondering, you know, where's Camille? She just got the sex change surgery. Where is she? It's been a while. We want to go see her. We want to go see her new pussy. Let's go see Camille. So they go over to Camille's house and they found her lying in her own feces, unable to stand, unable to speak. And they promptly brought her to a hospital. And of course the doctors had no idea what was going on because they'd never seen this before. So they were like, whoa, what the hell is this? They were doing MRIs, CAT scans. She had a temporary colostomy bag. And she said that at one point, she actually had six surgeons operating on her at once. She said the pain was so excruciating that she was screaming at the top of her lungs for 24 hours straight. Over the course of about a year, Camille ended up spending over $60,000 to repair the damages that Dr. Brown had done to her body. Thankfully, these horrifying stories worked and Dr. Brown was unanimously convicted and sentenced to 15 years to life in prison, where he later died in prison due to pneumonia and poor health, nearing the age of 88 on May 16th, 2010. Now, I am telling you the story for two main reasons. First of all, um, this has just been weighing heavy on my head. I've been thinking about it a lot. I take notes, like when I was recovering from my bottom surgery a year or so ago, I was taking these notes and I was just wondering when I was gonna be able to make a video and tell you guys all about this. So I just had to share the fascinating but terrifying story of Dr. Brown. And two, I'm telling you the story because it sheds a light on the treatment of transgender people in the medical field. Doctors like Butcher Brown are still in operation and girls continue to go to them because of the malpractice that is in professional offices. Thankfully, things are so much better today. We have better surgeons, better surgeries, better procedures, and better understanding of transgender individuals but this still continues to happen. And with administrations like the Trump administration releasing press notices saying that hospitals and homeless shelters could turn away transgender women or posting memos saying how to spot a transgender woman, I'll link that in the description below. It's very triggering, so a heads up, but I do recommend you read it, it's important information. But because of administrations and policies like this, it keeps trans women going to these terrible doctors and it keeps us dying. 
it's this reality that Dr. Brown was trying to use in his defense. He was saying that he was the only doctor that would operate on society's rejects that no one else would work on trans patients and he was just doing them a favor. He felt righteous and that God was speaking out to him to operate on God's children. But he was also cutting off random people's legs. And I get that like you're an adult and you can consent, whatever. I don't, that's someone else's business. What I'm saying is that he literally saw trans women and people that wanted their legs cut off to get a heart on as being the same. And that completely derails the movement. This man goes down in history as the worst sex change doctor in history and is infamously known as Dr. Butcher Brown. Plastic surgery has always been a big part of the transgender experience, especially among trans women. Even with better conditions today and with things like insurance and better understanding, I still know girls now that get work done and back alley doctors and get pumped with illegal silicone all the time. In fact, some of your favorite YouTubers, whether you know or not, have been pumped with silicone. So that is a huge issue within the transgender community and I will be bringing this up in a future video. I've actually done quite a bit of research and done a few surveys of my own and I will let you guys know all about those results in a video coming up eventually. All right guys, that was the story of Dr. Butcher Brown and that was the first episode in my new series, Makeup and Queer Story. Thank you so much for watching this video. Please let me know what you guys think in the comments down below. Did you like it? Did you not like it? Do you have suggestions for future videos or how to make this one better? Please let me know what you think. I am so excited about this new series. And let me know, let me know what you think in the comments down below. Do you think he was trying his best and trying to help the trans community? Or do you think he was just a terrible monster? I'm closer to the terrible monster side, but I mean like I'm open for debate. Thank you so much for watching this video. If you liked it, please give it a big thumbs up and share it. You know that helps my channel so much. Subscribe down below if you are not already a part of the fam. All of my social media will be linked in the description down below, as well as a link to my merch, which is on Redbubble, Amazon merch, and on Teespring. I have all kinds of different LGBT merch and pride merch for you, so if you're interested, all sorts of t-shirts, stickers, whatever is just linked in the description down below, baby, go check it out. And with that, I'm gonna say thank you all again. I had a great time sitting down with you and I can't wait to see you all next week. Please have a great rest of your day or night or more, whatever you're watching this. Thank you so much. I love you, bye.